This is a novel in progress. I am probably about a third of the way through it. Uh, it may be the next novel or it may be the one after that. I wasn't looking where I was going. I know how many times that Genevieve told me not to look back at a pursuer. Not that she knew bugger all about running. But she was right. You only lost more time looking over your shoulder, psyched yourself out and did stupid things, such as tripping over your own feet, which I had just done. I stumbled, fell on my butt onto the short low incline down to the rocky beach. I got my heels under me, but my slide continued. I decided to go with it. The incline was only a few strides long, and speed seemed to be the better part of valor right now. I reached the bottom, stood, dusted my palms off, one of them stung. I put my hand down to steady my fall, and it skinned it from my trouble. I looked back up the incline to the bike path. My pursuer was tracking through the undergrowth on the far side of the path. It glanced my way. I hunched down and did a stooped run over to a, hulk, a huge hulk of junk nearby, the rusted out half of a trunk's front cab partially buried on the shore. I hid behind it and peered through its painless front window. Today, the thing looking for me had the form of a child, just old enough to walk. It was tracking up and down the area on chubby legs. Soft brown curls framed its cherub's face. It wore rugged little baby jeans turned up at the cuffs in the cutest way. A pair of sweet kitty runners on its feet, white, trimmed with aqua and pink. They were the kind with a red light in their heels that flashed every time the creature took a step. It always got one thing wrong, though almost like it couldn't help revealing itself, itself or themselves. I'd never known whether it was the same creature hunting me or whether a different one came every time. Whatever, it always looked different. Today, the detail that gave it away was its hands. They were the size of a grown man's, not a small man either. With those hands, the thing previously rooted the underbrush, uprooted the underbrush as it searched for me. The bush out this way got easily two feet tall, enough for a person to hide in. My haint pulled up whole thistles, thorns and all, without any sign of discomfort. On the bike path, a motorbike slowly puttered by, idling so low I couldn't hear the engine. Its rider was a comfortably fat guy, big fro restrained by a bright orange bandana, cheerful face. He looked like he'd be good to hug, share a doobie with and listen to while he reminisced about Hendrix. He looked about the right age. He'd taken his t-shirt off and tucked its hem into the back waistband of his shorts. Smart. It was a hot day. I'd been longing to do the same thing. I'd been wondering whether the occasional hiker or dump truck driver would be taken aback at the sight of a woman topless but for a heavy, heavy duty sports bra. The Leslie Street spit felt like the type of place where the social rules could be relaxed a bit. Then I'd heard the blackbird cussing and seeing the eldritch child that had been trying to discourage from getting too close to its nest. Damn me for being so absent-minded. I'd been distracted by a first taste of warm weather. The guy on the bike spotted the thing chasing me and nodded a greeting at it. Absently, it gaped its jaws impossibly wide and stuffed a whole thistle plant into its mouth. Hey, it replied through a mouthful of chewing. It had a deep man's voice that matched the hands. It fastidiously brushed its hands off on the backs of its jeans. It was even creepier doing something so normal. The guy on the motorbike grinned at it, rode on. Whatever he'd seen, it had given him no cause for alarm or even curiosity. That was the other thing about my hands. They weren't invisible, but no one else saw them quite the same way I did. Glamours didn't work on me in predictable ways. An ozone effervescence to the air tickled at my nose. Storm coming. I was right at the shore of the expanse of the eerie inland ocean that is Lake Ontario. No way to miss the wide, flat thunderclouds spread out over half the sky. Grey-bottomed, it was waddling towards me like a grimy toddler with a full diaper. A fat, wet drop landed on the back of my neck. The storm cloud was about to drop its load, and soon, The thing chasing me must have gotten splatted, too. It flinched as though it had been stunned. It yelped and cast a panic look upwards, and mentally cheered for the storm to come on faster. As I'd learned over the years, my haint didn't much like water. In the back of my mind, when I'd run for the lake, 
I'd been thinking that in a pinch I could wade right in and try to wait the bastard out. It had been a cold refuge, though, still too early in the spring for the water to have warmed up. Now, with any luck, rainwater would save me the trouble. Nasty Brute was persistent, but we'd figured out a few reliable ways to discourage it over the years, my family and I. Probably the only reason I'd survived to adulthood. A few more drops came down, the haint yelped. It scanned the shore, even took a few steps closer in my direction, but the rain thickened suddenly. The haint made a snarling face, then ran off, swatting at the air the whole time. I watched until it disappeared into the dump truck depot off to one side. There was a steady drizzle spattering me now, but I breathed a sigh of relief and silently cursed myself for having let my attention slip long enough that I hadn't noticed that the hate was upon me until it had almost nowhere left to run. I had a look around the truck cab that had been my hiding place. Its lower edge was anchored with crumbling cement blocks, so it had probably been put here as part of the ballast holding together the landfill on which the lower part of Toronto was built. This whole strip of shore was a wild mix of junk and nature, one of those fascinating borderland places that cities foster so well. Thistle and chamomile bushes poked their way through rounded shards of broken china. I stepped out of the shelter of the cab. I needed help and I knew it. Dad couldn't do a thing for me in his present condition. The storm started herding wavelets ahead of itself to shore. They batted, cat-like, at my sandaled feet. The fine drizzle was misting up my glasses. In a minute, I begged. Can I have one minute, two, just two minutes? The water seemed to recede a fraction, both in the lake and above it. I could have been imagining it, but I still said a polite thank you. You never know. <laughs> I began searching the beach. Good thing about waterfront dump sites. They made for lots of drift glass. I found a few pieces, but only one nicely frosted one, and it was colorless. No use to me. In total, my finds were a handful of frosted beach glass pebbles, two black goose feathers and one white one, and a bleached fish vertebrae I'd found high up on the shore. It was a good inch across. <coughs> Dad had told us that Mom used to like collecting bones. I looked around. No hate. I squatted down on the sand and began to sort the stuff I'd found. The fishbone was cause for hope. Maybe this time the pieces were a message, not just random crap. One time, a shell from this lake sure had whispered, eat your peas, when I held it to my ear. That had been the last time, though. I'd been about nine. Never did start eating my peas. <laughs> I mean, it's not like she could make me. <laughs> there was a pockmark in one of the pieces of beach glass. The tip of one of the feathers fit exactly into it. Looked as though the tines of the fishbone would neatly cradle one of the other pieces if I just found the right angle. Hope thumping at my chest, I began trying to mesh the two together. A sudden hiss of rain peppered me, the sand, the water. The wavelets were kissing at the shore again. <sighs> my two minutes were up. All right, all right, I said, I'm going. Bloody hell, I'd have to try to read the message later. 